Good morning. Welcome back to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. My guest today is my old friend, John Morgan. John Morgan, you might have recognized his name from Morgan in the Morning, if you're old radio guys, or you might remember his name from John Morgan Seminars. He uh, hired me a few years back to join his company where we traveled around the country doing seminars for weight loss and smoking cessation, hypnosis seminars for weight loss and smoking cessation. He's an amazing guy. I met him first when we were both studying with Dave Dobson. So this is oh, kind of a another episode of what I learned from Dave, except this time is what I learned from John. Probably, probably, possibly from Dave originally, but still, he has a book that's called Interruption, which is brilliant. And I want to talk to him all about it today. So that's what we're going to be doing in just a minute. Stay tuned. You are listening to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, a show devoted to uncovering the systems and the secrets that set the best apart, where you learn how to take your coaching clients to the next level, while you grow the coaching practice of your dreams. So sit back and relax, or sit up and get excited. Either way, you might want to pay attention. This could be important. John Morgan. Doug O'Brien. I live and breathe. You got a little home studio though, it looks like. You look very professional. Yeah, what I do is I record uh, writings that I've done for the last 17 years, and uh, I just put them out as what I call a mini podcast. And I... Oh. Uh, basically put them up daily and then weekly i have what i call a grasshopper notes essay that i do once a week that i've been doing for close to 17 years now wow grasshopper yeah. notes is that uh, something we can access oh absolutely grasshopper no go into wherever you get your favorite podcast and look for grasshopper notes podcast and uh there are thousands and thousands of recordings <laughs> wow very nice. And the Grasshopper, do you still have a blog, the Grasshopper Notes blog? Yeah, I mean, the, the blog sort of fell by the wayside. I mean, I still post weekly to it, but uh, the mainstay is the podcasting channel and the YouTube channel. Okay, very nice. So you do the YouTube podcast as like we're doing right now. It's a live discussion, but it's still, it's on YouTube. Yeah, I, it's not live, but I mean, it's oh, yeah, recorded yeah, yeah. and I post it up to YouTube along with, I think I mentioned the last time we were together, all the different uh, DVDs and CDs that I have um, made over the years, I put up on my YouTube channel and they're all free. Wow, that's brilliant. You know, one of the things I always really loved about working for John Morgan Seminars is that it really did rely on hypnosis. You know, we 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 did hypnosis for people and the the products we sold in the back of the room were hypnosis CDs that you made. And absolutely. Oh, yeah. It was like, this stuff works. Well, so. the, other, the interesting thing that I remember, um, and the layman doesn't grasp this, but watching somebody like you work or watching somebody like Dave work or Tony Robbins work, you can see in action, uh, things that, don't seem like they're hypnosis <laughs> and you're really working the crowd yeah. and uh you know people don't glom onto that because you know they're kind of paying attention to the words but uh they're not necessarily noticing what it is that you do and you know you do some magic in the background there you know whether it's with your uh, hypnosis or your havening or you know sleight of mouth all the things that you do um there's a portion of that that comes around the corner mm. that's yeah. you know not directly on it you know i really appreciate that yeah and i'm glad you put me with such much good company you know dave and tony oh hell yeah i mean <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I, you know the thing is uh you know we would get feedback when we did the, uh, the seminars and the one thing that came back over and over and over again was people love Doug. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's yeah. so, like you're saying some of this, you know, this sort of talking thing that we do in the seminar, they don't really recognize that as any sort of hypnotic process or whatever. 
But it starts before the seminar starts. I mean, I would go around as you did, you know, just meeting people and using Dave Dobson's other than conscious hello. Yeah. To meet people, get their names. And so it's it's not John, is it? Or you know, you, <laughs> and, it, it's amazing to me that how second nature that stuff is now. Yeah. Uh, you know, at one time it was I had to remember to do it, but now it just I don't know, it just seems to come out. Well, I would get to the seminars, as you taught me, I would get to the seminar that started at six. I'd get there at 530 and I'd work the crowd. I'd just go around and meet people. But yeah. I'd be, you know, getting there other, other than conscious yeses and other than conscious noes. And and I would use them throughout the, the evening, you know, sort of surreptitiously giving some direct suggestions to that guy in the corner or whatever. It was really, really fun. Especially when you were getting a no signal. Are you with me? Yeah, I'm just wondering, are you with me? And then some guys going, you know, like, uh, or, you know, or whatever he was doing for no. Right. Well, you might tailor something for him specifically. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Might even go stand next to him for a minute or two. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nothing like, uh, uh, what's what am I looking for? Kind of a um, being partially in the spotlight to put a person into a trance, whether they want to be one or not. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, uh, uh, back in the day, I've, uh, oh God, I'm going back 40 years. Maybe, uh, the fella I worked for, uh, taught me to do stage hypnosis mm. and uh, I had never done it. And so he asked me to go to this temple and do a show he couldn't make it that night could you fill in for me i said oh, yeah we'll see <laughs> well, <I> got... <laughs> I mean, it's funny when you're younger you got a lot more confidence than you are when you're older you know it's like being on the high dive when you're a kid oh no big deal you get up there now you feel like you're going to get a nosebleed but uh yeah so i would go and i would do these things and i mean like it was amazing to me that some people, you know, how afraid they are. And what I found was that the person that was most afraid would put his fear right out there. Like, we'll take a guy, for example. By God, I bet you can't hypnotize me. I know he's scared to death. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, and that, that, that was a learning experience. So let's talk about a little bit about what we both learned from Dave Dobson, and I think is one of the things that is not only Dobson's other than conscious communication, but also often recognized and, and, and talked about in Ericksonian hypnosis, which is the idea of, of pattern interrupts. That in order for a person to get a new pattern, they need to kind of get rid of the old pattern first. So your whole book is called Interruption, and I'm assuming well, I know because I read the book twice now. Um, <laughs> that's what it's about. But I wanted to hear it from you. Like, where where is that from? Where did you get? Is it is it Dobson? Is it Erickson? Or is it is it Morgan? I mean, where? Well, you know, I I think it's a conglomerate. Um, or a, what would the word be? I can't come up with the right word. Um, it's combination. A combination, yeah. Uh, but. What I found out was, and it's in the book, um, that when I was back in broadcasting and first beginning, I had a job in St. Louis. And I grew up in Philadelphia. And Philadelphia, like many places, has a, an accent unique to them. And one of the words in Philadelphia ease, if you will, is the word uh, W-A-T-E-R. The stuff oh, that you drink. Wooder. Yeah, wooder. That's what they call it in Philly. Yeah, I'm really thirsty. I think I'm going to have some wooder. So I'm on the air in St. Louis, and I'm saying, boy, it's really hot out there today. Make sure to replenish your uh, fluids and drink plenty of wooder. Well, the program director came up to me after my show and said, uh, wooder? I said, yeah, really hot day out there. You want to drink some wooder, <laughs> wooder, right? He said, come with me. And he took me into another recording studio that wasn't on the air. And he recorded himself saying the word water and me saying the word water. <laughs> and it took about, I don't know, seven, eight times for me to hear the difference. Oh, okay, I'm saying something different than him. 
And so I wanted to be a professional. So I'm practicing now water, 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 water in my car. You know, I'm doing everything. Well, it's not working because I'd say, boy, you know, uh, it's really hot and uh, it's been dry spell here. You may want to water your lawn, right? And, and then one day it hit me in midstream. I said, yeah, it's a really hot day. You probably want to water your grass. And what I found out that day was the more often that I interrupted what it was a pattern that I had of speech, the sooner, and I corrected it, the sooner the new pattern took hold. And so the only time I ever say the word water to this day is when I tell the story. It becomes second nature. So the key to pattern interrupting, as far as I'm concerned, is you when you find yourself doing something that is counterproductive, a counterproductive pattern, you're about to, somebody says, you're an asshole. Oh, no, no, you're, you know. Yeah. That kind of thing. When you catch yourself, about to go into your automated or reactive pattern, at that point, you interrupt yourself and you wait for something else to come up. Uh, Jerry Stocking, whom we both know, another Dave uh, student from Days of Yore, um, talks about responses. Like, he'll give you a word, say, ocean. What's your first response? And then you give him a word. What's your second response? Your third, your fourth, your fifth. And it goes on down the line. And he said, well, your reaction is your first response to that word. And the further you go down the line, uh, the more um, ideas that you get. And if you go 25 down the line, you go into like this little bit of a trance. It's it's a great exercise to do. Um, But the point is, that your first response is often not productive. And if you catch yourself either in midstream or just about before it comes out, Mm -hmm. then you can interrupt it. And that interruption takes you to the doorstep of change. That's a a bumper sticker right there, Mr. (laughs) And, you know, when you get to the doorstep, to step through, you got to continue to practice. This isn't a one-time thing. Right. It, you do it over and over. You catch yourself. You catch yourself. You and you interrupt what it is that you're doing. I mean, it's just it's a soft what I call a soft piece of magic. Mm-hmm. No, it's beautiful, and it you know it, it ties in so well with my history of playing music. You know, as if you if you learn a mistake, like if I'm playing in G major and I don't put the F sharp in there or something like that. And my fingers learn to go to the F, not the F sharp. It takes forever to unlearn that, you know, to get those F sharp back where it's supposed to be. It's just, it takes forever to unlearn those mistakes. Um, and it's also really interesting that, you know, I, I think that the idea of interrupting a pattern is, is uh, so often the thing that, you know, People think it's like a click word, like automatic response, you know, it just happens without thinking about it. But there is a moment, there is a second, there is a place where you could step into that little doorstep. You could stop if you have that awareness. And at first it's like it might go past you, like you're already through the door before you recognize that, oh, shoot, I should have stopped. But the more you do it, the more the the gap gets a little bit bigger. And finally you can say, okay, stop. Let's 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 not go through the door this time. Let's go through this way, you know. But it takes it does take some practice. Oh yeah, there's no question. I mean, uh, it's back to the seminars for a minute. One of the things that people expect is instant change. You know, mm-hmm. maybe they they got sure. indoctrinated with like Tonyisms and stuff like that. You know, yeah. it's going to happen, and we're going to do it now and. Uh, Oh, just just hypnosis. I got yelled at sometimes by people in the, in the John Morgan seminars because we promised things on the radio. I said, we didn't ever promise what you just said we promised. You know, we no. don't re- listen to those ads. We are very careful about what promises we make. 
But people think hypnosis, oh, he's going to click his fingers and I'm going to change. And it's just all going to be because of that hypnotist that made me change. Well, yeah, that was one of the things that I did in the seminar. When it was arithmetic. I said, oh, right. yeah, yeah, you know, like the, when you were a kid, you learned the times tables or the multiplication tables. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How much is three times nine? Eh, 27. Five times eight? 40. What's your middle name? Boom. You know, the answers were right there. Yeah. Okay. I said, okay, now let me extend it a little bit. How much is 12 times 11? And people will go, like, uh, um, no, 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 no. I said, okay, well, 12 times 12 is 144. Of course, if I minus 11 from it, or is it minus 12? And I said, the answer is 132. I said, but, you know, it doesn't come to you as quickly as three times nine, four right. times eight, or your middle name. Right. I said, there's a reason for that. Because when you were a little, whatever your name was, uh, they made you say them over and over and over again where it's second nature. Yeah. And I said, that's what has to happen with patterns. They have to become second nature, whether it's you shooting for the F sharp or whatever it is. Right. It's right. got to be second nature. Otherwise, it's going to be stilted, you know. Right. And, in, and in a way, that's a trance, isn't it? You know, you're doing it without thinking. Yes, right. your other than conscious mind, as David called it, or your unconscious mind, as maybe Erickson would call it. But it's you're not doing it consciously. You're not doing that one forty four minus twelve. No, no, no. It's you. Know? It, you <laughs> yeah. Boom! It's right there. Five times five, twenty five. Boom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, how does the ordinary person tell me about why did you write this book? How can this really be applied to like the everyday person? Uh, well. Because I'm assuming this book is not like for therapists, teaching therapists how to do this stuff. Well, it could be. Um, and I've had a number of therapists. It's not a book. Let me you just, can uh, get it. It's free. It's online. Absolutely free. Uh, you're not going to get this book, but you'll get a PDF. And uh, the person, I guess they don't understand the difference between uh, stimulus and a response. Most people go stimulus reaction. Mm. So there's a stimulus out there and we have a reaction to it. And that's conditioned. We've had, we've been conditioned over time to tell you a quick story. And it, it's also in the book. Another story. Gosh, God, we're going to be talking about hypnosis, not all these damn stories. Right. So I'm up in Augusta, Maine. Oh, God, I don't know, back in the 80s sometime. And I'm doing a seminar for a computer company. Um, I think it was Stop Smoking or whatever. And I, I was talking about the difference between a reaction and a response. And there was this young kid there, 28, strapping lad, you know. And I said, uh, his name was Sean, as I recall. Hmm. I said, Sean, um, let me ask you a question. What do you do if somebody calls you a derogatory name? He said, I'd whack them. I said, you'd whack them? He goes, yeah, I'd whack them. I said, oh, okay. I said, Sean, do you know who Billy Martin is? He went, uh, isn't that the Yankees dude? He used to be the Yankees manager? I said, yeah. I said, do you have any guesses as to how old Billy is? He said, I don't know, late 50s. I said, good guess. He's 58. I said, uh, Sean, do you know anything else about Billy Martin? He goes, yeah, he gets fights and bars. I said, oh. I said, so when you're 58, Sean, do you want to be getting in fights and bars? He goes, no way, man. I said, well, what magical metamorphosis is going to happen between now and then to keep you from whacking somebody when they call you a name? So what's your response? Somebody calls you a name and you say, oh, oh you're an idiot. Well, if you knew me a little better, you might like me a little more. <laughs> you know, that's a different, it's a response. And one... It, this is for, I'm sure you have some married couples watching or, you know, people in a relationship. And anybody that's been together for a while 
can predict what the other person is going to say or do when they say or do something. You know it in advance. They know it in advance. <laughs> so that's your reactions, you know, playing with each other. You're not even involved anymore. It's just your reactions. So what happens is you throw in something different instead of your normal reaction. Like then you wait for another response to come along, sort of like airplanes on a runway. You know, you don't take the first one. You, you Maybe you get the third or the fourth or the fifth response. And you offer that back. And basically what you do is you throw a monkey wrench into that communication because the other person is not expecting that. Right. And that causes them to have a different reaction. So it broadens the field, so to speak. That's nice. That's nice. You know, it's interesting. When I was a um, music major in college and I uh, was taking composing classes from a composition professor, um, he said that the trick to being a real composer, being an original composer, you know, having your own unique sound, he said, is to listen for your first voice. He said, you have to listen for your first voice, but be careful. He said, because your first voice is rarely the first voice that you hear. <laughs> yes. Right. Because what comes out is a reaction. But if you just pause and, you know, listen more carefully to, you know, what your response is, not just your reaction. Yeah. You know, something more truthful comes out, something yeah. more real, more deeper, more deeper. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, your your high school nun or whatever would have had a ball with that. Yeah, yeah, and it's also interesting that um, you know when speaking of 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 music and first voices and that sort of stuff, um, that idea of conscious versus unconscious. Erickson was was basically always saying that trust you should trust your unconscious mind. You should must trust your unconscious mind, which is fa fantastic advice. You know, it's great advice. Um, but sometimes people think of the, that first voice, that automatic reaction is their unconscious talking. And, it, and sometimes it's just a learned habit, habitual response. Erickson often said that, you know, you don't need to go back and do psychological archaeology to change somebody. You know, it's just... Mm -hmm psychological archaeology you don't really need to do that but people are are habit creatures they're creatures of habits and so they just have a habit of reacting this way and if you were to interrupt that pattern and not just automatically respond to think you know what would be a better response even though your conscious mind is therefore involved in the process you know you also can get in touch with you know, your multiple intelligences, not what just your brain says, but what your heart says, you know, not what just your brain and your heart says, but what your gut tells you and, you know, feel your way through a little bit more and to actually get a fuller response, a more full response. Absolutely. Um, I'm thinking of doing a talk show again, going back a million years. And there was this woman on and she was obtuse. I mean, she... Uh, you know, she just wanted, she was one of those people that wanted to argue without the facts and was quite vociferous with, you know, her opinions. And, but she was, you know, presenting them as facts. And so basically I was boxing her into a corner, you know, to, you know, I felt like, you know, a trial lawyer came out here and, <laughs> and I, so on the way home, I'm listening to a tape of the show. And I said to myself, oh, my God, I said, you just beat up an old lady. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, you know, I got the gift of awareness a little bit late. Uh, and uh, I took that a little bit forward in that I, did, I wasn't as uh, <laughs> I wasn't as uh, combative as I might have been in some cases. Which so do you have a, a technique that you can teach us for um, how to do this more easily? Is there a, a process or something that you've gleaned over the years to, to be more interruptful? The, the one thing I talk about all the time is noticing. In other uh -huh. words, notice your pattern. In other words, get you like you said moments ago, they're out of your awareness. You just do them. You're conditioned to do them. Um, start to notice 
patterns that aren't working. Mm. In other words, get to work. So once you notice, then you can interrupt. But you can't interrupt if you don't notice them. If you don't know you have it, you can't interrupt it. So start paying attention to yourself and what you do autom on automatic pilot. I'm hearing a little tweak in the background. I don't know. I don't hear. There's some birds singing, if that's. Oh, there you go. Is that Why do birds <laughs> suddenly appear? <laughs> Uh, so yeah, interesting because the idea of noticing is challenging because we so often just do stuff. I remember from from the seminars when I was you know modeling you and how you did the seminar so that I could you know have it be a John Morgan brand when I took over the reins for a while. Um, I remember you telling people like you know uh, notice if you put the toilet paper over the top or under the bottom or, or to put your left pant leg on first before you put your right leg pant leg on, you know, when you get dressed in the morning or, you know, and then, and then do it different. Try if you, if you, if you put your left pant leg on first and listeners at home, try this sometime, be sure you're near your bed when you do it. Cause it'll be, be awkward. But if you notice that when you get dressed in the morning, you put your left pant leg in first, stop. And then try it the other way. Put your right pant leg in first and just see what that's like. You know, mix it up. Brush your teeth with your left hand if you're always doing it with your right hand. Try and it. One, one thing that's guaranteed is you will be uncomfortable. Mm, mm. And so it's the discomfort that you have to go through to get to a comfortable area. For yeah. example, one of the examples is fold your hands. Okay. All right, go ahead. Just fold your hands. All right, well, what thumb is on top? Uh, my left thumb is on top. All right, put the right thumb up on top. Should I move all the fingers or just the thumbs? No, right? just the thumbs. Okay. Notice how that feels different. That's bizarre. Yeah. So that is just the uncomfortable. That is a signal that I'm learning something new. Yeah. So when you get uncomfortable interrupting, you know, a pattern. Yeah, I'm still hearing some... I don't know what it is. There are birds are continuing to sing. So if it does sound right. fierce, it's probably it. If it's something else, I have to take it off and post. post but anyway, it. that that aside, um, there was one thing that you touched on earlier that I wanted to go back to. And it was something that uh, one of your Ericksonian friends said, and I think I actually quoted him in my book. And it was something to the effect of, um, I just, just did a thing the other day on, um, are you in therapy? Uh -huh. And by and large, I said, there are probably more people in therapy now than at any time in history, uh, for whatever the reasons. And I said, people, when they get into therapy, you know, they're looking for a good therapist. And I said, a therapist is a good one that has three things going for them. One, um, they've heard your story before. Maybe you're a different version of it, but they've heard it. The second thing is they have no emotional investment in your problem. So they're not going to get emotionally involved with, you know, the same way you are. And thirdly, they have a track record of success. I said, but here's what I find with most therapy that I witness, and that is people wanting to know why I am the way I am, okay? And there are people that spend years and years at to Howard Stern, for God's sakes. Who needs to go to therapy three days a week, you know? And by and large, what you're finding out is, this is why I am the way I am. Mm -hmm. and, and the point of it is, suppose they dropped you off on a deserted island, whether it was by helicopter, plane, parachute, you're on the deserted island. How does focusing on how you got here, whether it was parachute, plane, or helicopter, do anything to get you off of that island? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... If, if I'm not mistaken, the guy that 
I quoted, who's a friend of yours, an Ericksonian guy, he was saying that build a bridge from where you are to where you want to go. Mm. Going back, it's just a history lesson. There you go. You know, that's all it is. It's a history lesson. So right now, what, and you know, quoting Dave here, everybody's their own best therapist. If you start to notice the things that are going awry in your life or the patterns that you have that aren't working for you. Mm -hmm. uh, as a euphemism, I said, I used to say, how many people in the room have the same religion as their parents? You know, and a smattering of hands would go up. I said, did they ask your permission? You know, they didn't. But you got it, and by God, you're going to argue for it, and my way is the right way, and da 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 da, da. All right, that's how you got here. I understand that. Now, is that where you want to be? Is your religion working for you? Good, stay with it. If it isn't, you need a new religion. So you got to go somewhere else. So how do you go from where you are to where you want to be? And I think that's what your friend said. Build a bridge mm. from where you are to where you want to go. That's and, right. you know, I think if more therapy worked on that aspect, uh, people would spend a lot less time and a lot less money in therapy. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I do want to go back to what you were saying before, the, the inter interrupting the automatic response, because I find that so useful. Um, even when I'm doing coaching with people and I ask them, what are their top values and what's most important to you in life? You know, most people will come up with a set of like three, four or five things. They say, well, um, honesty is most important or success or whatever. They'll, they'll have their five. And then I'll say, okay, great. What else is most important to you? And they're like, mm, mm. I don't know. That's, that's pretty much it. I said, oh, really? Let's, yeah. start, let's think of what else it could be. I mean, there could be. <laughs> health and i start listing like all these 40 other things and they go like oh wow yeah i need health in there too and then they start putting these other things in there and pretty soon their list of four or five has gotten to a list of like 20. and then when we finally have exhausted the list and figure that's just about it um then i'll say let's 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 reorganize now let's see what actually is most important to you so we yeah. go through the list and we we com compare one to the other until it you know reorganizes the whole thing and 99 times out of 100, almost every time, something that had not been on their top list that they had just sort of spurred it out will, will be number one. Like that health thing will be number one now or, or something else will be number one that they hadn't even had on their list the first time. Well, tied right into that a million years ago uh, when I was working in Kansas City, I was out of work. And uh, I was uh, I was doing a radio job and they changed formats and I didn't want to do what they were doing. So I was looking for work and <clears throat> I went to this seminar run by a fellow named Richard Bowles. Are you familiar with Richard? I am not. No. OK. Richard wrote the book. Uh, what color is your parachute? Oh, yeah. I know that book. Yeah, sure. OK. His brother apparently was some kind of a Methodist or some kind of minister out in Arizona, or no, no, he was a minister. His brother was a investigative reporter in Arizona who got blown up by the mob. That's just a sidebar. But he, during this seminar, he got you to focus on what it is that you want. But what I got out of it was this list. And for example, using your thing with people what are your top three okay well you know family and, and whatever it is those are the most important things to me well what about and what about and so you get them to expand their list what he did on his list is he would take for example i have a guy uh currently i'm working with and he wants to publish a book and he wants to do this that and the other thing so he's got seven things on his list so what you do is you take point number one and you compare it to point number two. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like a battle of the bands. You know, is it going to be Chris Bodie or Miles Davis? You know, you can only have one. Right. Uh, so, so if it's one, okay, you put a check mark next to one. Then you do one against three, one against four, one against five, one and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Then you come back to the beginning and you go two against three, 
against four against five, three against four. And then you look at the number of check marks and the thing that you thought was at the top of your list, whether it's a grocery list or, you know, life uh, enhancement list, uh, what you're going to find is the one that you thought was at the top <laughs> 99 times out of a hundred to quote you isn't at the top. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was trying to say before. I think you just said it better than I did, but that's, yeah, that's exactly the process that I would take people through. Yeah. So it's really important that we listen to our first voice, but remember that it's not necessarily the first voice that pops up and to interrupt your own patterns by noticing if they're working or not. Um, Dave Dobson likes the word other than conscious or liked the word other than conscious communication instead of unconscious or subconscious yep. because he thought it was more accurate because sometimes we are doing these patterns. We know we're doing these patterns. But we don't want to be doing these patterns, but we're doing them because it's not our conscious mind. It's not our unconscious mind. It's this other than conscious part that's doing it. Mm -hmm. so we need to be able to, um, you know, change that. One of Dave's processes that I don't think I've heard anybody else use this term except Dave and you um, is the subjective reversal. I love it. Can you describe what that is? What is the subjective reversal? Because I'm sure I, I don't know. know. I, I, mine would probably be a bastardized explanation, but well, here's yeah. here's what it is to me. Go for it. And we'll go back to our, uh, what we have in common here when we did the seminars for Stop Smoking. So I would say to people, whether in trance or not, when you go to the convenience store and you see racks and racks of cigarettes, that will trigger in your mind your desire to be smoke-free. Anytime you see a billboard for, uh, you know, your brand, it will trigger in your mind the ability to, you know, be smoke-free. And all these, so you were taking the subject and reversing the response. Mm -hmm. And that's the simplest I can explain it. I'm sure you have a more delicate explanation. Oh, no, no. That's great. That's perfect. No, because that is exactly right. What, what, what it means, the subjective reversal, is the things that used to trigger your response. You know, so you take that trigger that created the response and you hook it up to some other response. So the trigger will still be there. But, you know, if I used to, used to be, if I saw those, those shelves full of cigarettes or used to be, if I saw those commercials, I'd want to have a cigarette. I'd be like, yes, I love that. That's my, so that trigger of responses would, would, would trigger a response of like, yes, I want the cigarettes. But we're now saying is that same trigger will trigger a different subjective response of mm -hmm. saying, I want to be smoke free. Well, the other thing that ties within that, and I think it might be, in subjective reversal, I can't remember, but I remember it as a sidebar. And that is, so you rehearse yourself in some feelings, mm -hmm. whether they're, let's say confidence. You rehearse yourself in what confidence feels like. Okay. Now you go over to the thing that's upsetting to you. And you imagine that. Mm -hmm. Now you come back to confidence. And then you go back to the thing that's upsetting you and you go back and forth quicker and quicker and you make the transition quicker and quicker. Then all of a sudden they just seem to meld together. And then all of a sudden you have a different response. Um, if, if I can rehearse myself in, uh, all right. I'll give you another example. And this one I stole from Jerry Stocking. Not another story. No, not a story. This is a, you asked for techniques. So there you okay, go. Good, good, good. good. Go. So what Jerry would do is he would say, okay, uh, pretend there's a line on the floor from zero to a hundred. Where are you on that line for confidence? How confident are you? So you would put yourself you know, let's say you were 60% or 70%. And then what he would do, he says, okay, so that's 70% confident. He said, if you can imagine that you're 70% confident, he said, can you make yourself 30% confident? So he would shift you 
and physically shift you down the line to 30%. And he said, is there a different feeling for that? And, and there is. <laughs> and then you come back to, hey, okay, let's go back to where you were, 70%. Now, if you can be 70% confident, can you be 85% confident? So you move yourself physically on that continuum from, you know, up to 85. And you will notice a difference. And the point he makes is you made it up, all of it. You made up the 60%, you made up the 30%, you made up the 85%. But, you know, you actually did it and there was a, you know, a corresponding feeling that went along with it, meaning that you can go different places. And I think that's, you know, tied in somehow with subjective reversal. Nice. Yeah, that's really cool. So, yeah, it's so interesting because the, um, the, the, the core, the, linkages, <coughs> excuse me, of, you know, Ericksonian hypnosis to what Dobson did. Um, the, the thing that you just described um, with from Jerry Stocking is something I've used in an NLP class a dozen times. Um, you know, it, these, these things are all kind of yep. coming from different places, different sources, but they're all good. <laughs> they all work really well. You know, in, in the world of NLP, you know, Robert Dilts has often made the point that, um, the neurology is not just the stuff between your ears. So when you change your body, if you walk down that line, you know, from 60% to 85%, you know, there's a physical difference. Your, your neurology is that space as well. Walking yeah. and moving to, forward is different than moving backwards. And, and it all affects us differently. And so we can create that in a sense, physical metaphor, kind of like a, spoken story or whatever, but it's a physical metaphor of walking across the room, changes things. Nice. And stories change things as well. And I'm curious about your story, John, because um, I think that you have perhaps a greater capacity for noticing than a lot of people. You notice patterns in people. You can tell if a person's lying from a I, mile away. Um, I, I, I wish I could tell you I worked at it. I'm just I wondering. really do. Do you think that it comes from a story or did you have like a bad childhood that caused you to, to realize, oh, you got to be careful with these people. So watch. No, I actually, I actually, all right. Two stories, <laughs> <laughs> my mother and my paternal grandmother. Yeah. Okay. So I'll tell you about my paternal grandmother first. So I'm in fifth grade and I'm outside playing with this kid, kid I didn't normally play with, but I was playing with him. So my grandmother calls me in for dinner and she said, Johnny, I don't want you playing with that kid. And I said, why? She said, he's bad news. Hmm. And I said, well, he's my friend, grandma. What do you mean he's bad? Stay away from him. He's I. do you know him? No, I don't know him, but I know he's bad news. All right. Fast forward to about a week later, I'm hanging out with this kid. We go up to the railroad tracks and they have box cars park on the side mm -hmm. right? so we went into the box cars we're playing you know hobo or whatever you do when you're at that age and there's some straw in the box car so i see him over in the corner piling this straw together said, what the hell is he doing you know all of a sudden he reaches in his pocket he takes out matches and psh, poof, throws it onto the straw and of course we run like bandits the two of us well, luckily the fire went out, but the moral of the story is when he was in ninth grade, he went to reform school. Mm. So that was my grandmother. Now my mom was a waitress, as she said, since the last supper. <laughs> so, so she got to see a lot of different people and catalog a lot of different patterns. So one day I was working around the corner from the restaurant she was managing and I went over there for a late lunch. It was like about one o'clock. Three guys walk in and I'm sitting at the bar having a Coke and a sandwich. And she walks over to me. She says, see those three guys over there? I said, yeah. See the guy in the middle? I said, yeah. He's bad news. <laughs> Same words, right? Yeah. He's bad news. I said, do you know him? She goes, never saw him before in my life. He's bad news. Week later guy was arrested for arson 
Setting straw on fire in a boxcar? Is that the same guy? Oh, well, the, the, the point is, uh, this guy, he had a method. <laughs> what he would do is he would go down, he was, he, you know, set buildings on fire for profit. Ah. Okay. So what he would do is he would go down with a birdcage into the sewer and he would get rats and he would put them in the birdcage. And then he would get to the site where he was going to set the fire and he'd dip the rats in kerosene. Yeah. Yeah. And light them on fire and they would run and they'd run up the curtains and the place is on fire. And of course, he would abscond with the birdcage. Now, when the fire marshals came in, all they saw was, you know, dead rat. Oh, he must have died in the fire. Never suspecting that, you know, this was the cause of the fire. So, wow. you know, they paid out the insurance or whatever. Wow. So, the, 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 the oh, hope, nobody has, <laughs> hope nobody's listening that has, wow, that's a yeah, great probably, great. Yeah, let's do that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> never the, saw that. The, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know what it is, but... All right. So these people on dating sites, there's a thing. I don't know what is this swipe right or swipe left. I One don't, of the I don't know. I'm, I'm okay. So I'm with this guy and he's on a dating site and, and he's stopping and looking and I'm going like, I mean, this, there's something coming at me from this picture that, hmm. Hmm. you know, uh, how do you know that? I said, I don't know, but I got a feeling of, or something. Hmm. Okay. So you feel like you kind of picked it up from your mother or your Who knows? Grandmother? Don't, I don't know the answer to that. All I know is it's pretty darn accurate. Yeah. Well, certainly the, the way that Dave Dobson codified some of the ideas of, of noticing how people say yes and how people say no opened my eyes to the differences and the patterns of people. You know, even what I just did with my eyebrows is, you know, it's a unique thing to me. And that, yeah, exactly. If you wanted to get some rapport, <laughs> that other than conscious hello, you'd go like, oh, really? Oh, really? <laughs> you do that, do you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you you mirror back to people their patterns and they say oh wow this guy's just like me and yeah so i mean i was just talking with this guy the other day i just met him online uh, and so i said so um you like focus and he goes how'd you know that and i said i don't know <laughs> <laughs> but Something came through. It was, all right, I'll, I'll give you an ex a real world example. Okay. Uh, years ago, I may have told this story the last time. I'm not sure. I had occasion to be at Harvey Weinstein's house. Oh, Harvey and Corky. Back in the day. Well, yeah, and that's um, that's part of the story. Oh, so, sorry. hope I didn't no, ruin the story. No, no, no. You didn't ruin it. it okay. You just added to it. So I'm working with somebody, but I'm at his house. Okay. All right? And so he's not there. He's off doing whatever he's doing. This is about 12, 13 years ago. Okay. And so we conclude whatever we had, business we had, me and this person and he walks in the room and he says uh who's this and the person says oh this is john morgan blah 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 um why didn't you use the british guy <laughs> you know the, the what's the guy over britain that, that helped ellen stop smoking pretty famous paul, dude um, paul mckenna yeah paul mckenna you know, you want, yeah she says i've I just found him and, you know, Baba. So I said, well, Harv, I said, you, Harv. <laughs> I, <couldn't laughs> know him, right? I said, Harv, you have no uh, reason to remember this. I said, but we've already met once. We have? I said, yeah, back in Buffalo. 
I said, uh, the guy that I worked with used to do your commercials. He goes, oh yeah, Don Burns. I said, yeah, Don Burns and I, you know, we worked the same radio station, right? And he's, so now I'm starting. So now he sits down, he goes, oh, I'm having, I've got this problem, you know, I just, Oh, I'm upset stomach all the time and this and that. And you know, my mother was a lousy cook and she didn't cook anything. We always ate pizza and he's going on and on and on about this kind of thing. I said, well, you know, Harv, I said, I'm guessing that you have access to, you know, world-class nutritionists if you want to, right? Yeah, but I, you know, I don't even like vegetables and that kind of stuff. I said, well, I said, uh, that doesn't seem to really be the problem. And he said, what? I said, your anger is the problem. And he went, what did you tell him? It turns out <laughs> we didn't say anything about you and we didn't. Right. I said, it's apparent to anybody that wants to pay attention that you're an angry person. Mm. I said, and people, I said, do you happen to know Mel Carmazan, whom I work for, who is, was the head of CBS and Infinity Broadcasting? I had worked for him at one time. He says, yeah, yeah, he's a good friend. I said, well, both of you, and I'm sure you're familiar with the Enneagram. So I said, both of you are Enneagram eights. And I said, Enneagram eights use their anger to build things like empires. And I'm guessing that you have enough money for the next seven generations of Weinsteins. <laughs> he laughed. He said, yeah. I said, so you don't really have to build anything else. I said, but that's not the point. I said, the point is that you have anger inside of you. I said, you want to attribute it to something outside of you. And I said, then you add the word because. I'm angry because that son of a, but, you know, and that I said, no, you have a feeling that you call anger in your body. I said, if you just sit with it, not talk to yourself about it, but just sit with the feeling, the feeling like Dave would tell us would register somewhere along the midline from your throat all the way down to your bowels, right? I said, somewhere you're going to get a sensation that you call anger. I said, sit with it. Just sit with it. When you go off to a thought about whose fault it is, come on back and sit with it. I said, what happens is it metabolizes that anger. And I said, it dissipates. Well, I didn't know he was a sexual predator at the time. <laughs> but, uh, you know, apparently he didn't take me up on my suggestion. Wow. So you were there to help him quit smoking? No. Oh. I wasn't there to help him at all. Oh, okay. So when they said, why didn't you get the Paul McKenna guy, they weren't talking about so that he, you could help him quit smoking like Paul McKenna helped. No, he, he was talking to the person I was helping, whom I will leave unnamed. I see. Okay. <laughs> Got it. So just for the record, um, I, I said Harvey and Corky because back in my early youth, back in Buffalo. Him um, and his brother. Right, yeah. I believe it. I'm sure it's his brother, right, Corky? It was. They um, they put on concerts. They put on yep. many of the first concerts that I ever attended. Um, yes, were pr productions of Harvey and Corky productions in Buffalo. So that was way before any of this, um, you know, other stuff happened. But probably still had a lot of anger issues, I would guess, um, in those days as well. Anyway, um, so that's why I said what I said. But that's a really interesting story. I'm gonna have to. Um, notice the clock here soon and, and I know we've been on this for about 54 <laughs> minutes and I don't want to take too much of your time. I, I'm sitting here admiring your haircut so. Oh thank you yes I, I was uh, thank you John I, I got a haircut this morning and up until now John was the only one who knew. Uh, <laughs> just... <laughs> you wear it well. <laughs> thank you. I'm glad I still need to cut it. Yeah. Anyway, well, um, it's the you're the Dorian Gray of self help. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Doug, Doug never ages. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's just stop there. And um, but John. Yes. Morgan, so 
why do you call it grasshopper notes? What is this? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Okay. So back in the day when we were doing the seminars, we would be on four to six airplanes a week, yep. six to 800 miles from venue to venue in a car or a truck or a van or whatever. So on the airplanes, I would take little eyes closed exercises, you know, like let the world go away. And all of a sudden I would get a thought pop into my head, just a random thought. So I had a little journal and I would write it down. And so during the course of a week, I might get seven, eight of these thoughts. So I'm home that weekend. It's a Friday night. I'm sitting in my lazy boy. And my youngest son walks in and he says, what are you doing? I said, oh, I said, I'm writing stuff down that just came to me out of the blue and little things. He said, like what? I said, well, here's one. I said, how much would you bet on a grasshopper race if their legs, if your thoughts were bound by the, no, oh, no. How much would you bet on a grasshopper race if your, if their legs were bound by the limitations of your thoughts? And he went deep and walked, <laughs> walked away, right? <laughs> Broken like that sign. Right. right. Yeah. Deep. <laughs> and then he bad. walked, you know, get the hell away, right? So now it's, it's a week later. I'm off another tour and I'm in the same lazy boy and I've got my journal out and I'm looking through it. And he walks in and he goes, Oh, grasshopper notes. So. Yeah. Just that's came to him out of the blue bear. That's what it became. So what happened was I would take these little thoughts that I had and, uh, you know, um, fair is only in fairy tales. I would, uh, that's a thought that I had. So I would flesh it out and I'd write a little bit of an essay, what I thought it meant. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would put up on a blog. And that's now what I put up on the podcast. I record them. And I put them up there every day at um, Grasshopper Notes podcast or, you know, grasshoppernotes.com. And like I said earlier, I write a weekly one. It's some thought that comes during the course of the week and I write it down. And the one that I did this past week was, are you in therapy? And, you know, that that's what prompted the conversation. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so, and if people want to get hold of some of these, you said all of the old John Morgan seminars recordings are. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it, here's the deal. <laughs> the name of the YouTube channel is Inside Out. Okay, all change happening on the inside before it comes out. Okay. okay. Problem is there's a kid's movie called Inside Out uh -huh. that I had no idea about. So I'm about 27 deep when you go to Inside Out. So if you search Inside Out on YouTube, John Morgan, then it may come up. Okay, but if, pe if people wanted to like get hold of your like quit smoking CD that you used that's to where they'll find them. Oh, that's where they find them on their YouTube channel. Yeah, find them on the YouTube channel. Okay, so Inside Out YouTube. Yeah, John Morgan Inside Out you'll find it. They'll be there, you know, else right. stop smoking and, and weight loss, if stress can, management. I can find a link, I'll put it in the, the program notes. Yeah. I, maybe I can find one for you. I, I'm embarrassed to admit that I don't know the, <laughs> the link, but if they want to hear the podcasts, uh, they can go to but Grasshopper it's, Notes podcast. And it is a wonderful thing that you put all those things out there for free because they're, they're excellent. And this book, is excellent this interruption book. well i'm glad you liked it I, I i mean basically i don't know how to write so this is really a collection of essays that mm -hmm. i put together that uh sort of come th to the same theme from a different angle it's sort of like the thing i learned from you about a circle having 360 degrees and back to doing exercises uh here you are at five degrees uh, what would it be like if you were over at 10 degrees you know if you move them on to that point on the circle <laughs> you have a different vantage point so this comes at interruption from a whole group of angles 
and a lot of Dave Dobson stuff in here and uh, that kind of stuff. Right. And you're mentioned in there. I, I, I noticed that. Yes. Doug O'Brien. I think if I remember the quote exactly, Doug O'Brien, who is a hypnotist who once was interviewing Bill O'Hanlon and Bill O'Hanlon said, yeah, that was it. Bill <laughs> O'Hanlon. That's the guy. Oh, that's the guy you were trying to think of. Before. Yeah. I couldn't ah. come up with his name. I, I knew he was an Ericksonian guy, right? Yes, definitely an Erickson. Yeah. Guy. yeah, he wrote a book called Taproots, which I also. Yeah, read. I've read that. It's a great yeah, book. Great book. Great book. He's written 40 books, but. Um, <laughs> Good for him. <laughs> yeah, but that's one of the Ericksonian ones that I left a lot. So, anyway, thank you for being here, John Morgan. Always a pleasure, Doug. Love talking to you. Love seeing you. You're just, you're a joy. Thank you. Right back at you. See you real soon. So long. This has been the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure seeing you again. Hope to see you again real soon. Come back next week when we have another gripping and exciting episode of the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. And if you want to, you can find out more about us, each and every one of us, at EssentialCoachingSkills.com. 